Hello and welcome to Full Disclosure, a podcast project conceived entirely to let me spend more time with interesting people than I would ever get on the radio. Um, Martin O'Neill, welcome. Thank you. A professional footballer, trophy collector, and now host of a, of a new podcast here at Global with Clive Tilsley, the Football Authorities. Right. Thank you very much for that introduction. And that's that's about it, really. <laughs> well, so, well, we'll find out. I'll, I'll be the judge of that. Um, we generally begin at the beginning, which takes us to Kilray in, in, in County Derry in, in 1952. You've described your family as a typical Irish nationalist Catholic family. What does that mean? I'll tell you what that means. It means that I have um, four brothers and four sisters, <laughs> big big family, <laughs> really. It's, it's as simple as that. Uh, no TV in our house until 1960. And uh, so... Um, no wonder you've got so many brothers and absolutely, sisters. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely right. So I'm kind of bang in the middle as well too. So And, um, and we are spread over a, a fair length of time, you know. And and I mean that means essentially that you're never lonely, but also never alone. That's true, uh, and, and that was great actually. Uh, growing up with uh, brothers, older brothers that you looked up to, and younger brothers that you could have uh, some fun with. So uh, it, it was terrific, really. It's an interesting detail. This I don't know where it came from. Um, his father Leo was one of two barbers in the town. Mm -hmm. that, that, was there a lot of rivalry? Was there? A, I mean, were, you, were you defined by who cut your hair? Whether it was Leo O'Neill or the other fella? Well, that is interesting, really, because the the, the village was not that big. I sure. must admit, even so. But I think that I th why are you surprised that there's two barbers in the <laughs> I village? Just thought it was an interesting detail oh, right, to I'll, have I'll, sort of emerged from the mists of time. Okay, I'll tell you what it was. It was maybe <laughs> yeah, maybe it was the fact that uh, my father um, I thought was an excellent hair cutter, and uh, <laughs> well, I, I'm expected to say that, and I think that. Uh, also, he was, um, despite being a, a, a Catholic, actually he had a lot of Protestant customers, and I think that was that was the point. So they 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 did like to come to him. So he had, uh, you know, he had a fairly fair-minded approach to life. So that, so it transcended sectarianism was the importance Sectarian. of a nice haircut. I, I, well done, That's really a, good point. It's important. This it's it's big stuff. Um, and and how big a role did Catholicism play at home? How, how, how... Uh, pretty big. Yes, absolutely. Um, rosary every night as well too. Really? Uh, yeah, well, all, all abs absolutely. Eleven of them. The, no, I as I said to you earlier, we were spread over. So my two two older brothers were at university. So right. Uh, from from me, probably from the age of maybe about, let's say, six years of age when I'm aware of yes. almost everything around me. So I had a couple of younger brothers, uh, older sisters, and uh, every night about half past seven, eight o'clock, you know, down, sitting to, uh, down on your knees in um, taking up your position in the sofa, mm. whatever the case may be. And uh, saying your particular decade as well, to the decade of the rosary. Gosh. And um, yeah, I mean, your mind's not always on it. Uh, I, I must admit, <laughs> you know. And I, I was a big. Um, uh, there was a comic out at that time called The Victor, really great comic, and it had this wonderful football story called The Goalmaker, shrouded in mystery. I must admit, really fantastic story. And when I finished the decade, I must admit that uh, my mind was wandering to the goal maker i think most of the time so uh, i forgot to i forgot to say the second part of the uh, the heel mary that, that would be association football the story in the that's in absolutely the right we'll get yes. on we'll get on shortly as to as to why that wasn't necessarily the obvious course for you to go down but i I'd, I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more about about family life presumably you shared a room did you until yes, leaving shared, home practically yes exactly uh, we didn't uh, the house wasn't that big uh, and actually, we were glad of the room when my brothers were off at university and my sister was away at, at training college in Hull. So, um, yeah, uh, when they came back, it became a little bit crowded, I must admit, but uh, it, it, we didn't seem to mind. And you know no different. None of us know any different. No. We've only got no, the one absolutely. childhood that we've exactly. got. So Strangely enough, there was a family um, about two doors down and uh, they had two children, boy and a girl. Uh, the lad was just a year older than me, and I spent a lot of time playing with him, the McCotter family. And sometimes I actually felt quite jealous that they'd a small family, and other times, most of the time, I didn't do. And in actual fact, in our conversations in later life, he was actually saying he wouldn't have minded a bigger family himself. So strange. And what about the sort of levels of comfort? Was it was it because you, your mum didn't work? She couldn't really with so many children. Absolutely no. My father, my father, uh, Saturday. It was a very, very busy day for him. 
and he did work. I must admit, he uh, he would leave he would leave home about seven o'clock in the morning, open up his shop. It was only about ten minute walk, and uh, and he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't be home till about eleven o'clock that evening. So we he would earn about twelve, thirteen, fourteen pounds in the uh, which was our weekly sum. And the one thing that we never went unfed. You know, we we had considering we didn't have that much money. Uh, my mother bought the best food for us. Seriously, the best food. So we might not have enjoyed Portuguese holidays. We certainly <laughs> didn't do that there, but we had the best of food. You mentioned school, so primary school, um, Catholic, boys only. Mm -hmm. um, was it Christian Brothers or anything like that? No, just the primary school itself okay. was, uh, no, there was, uh, um, uh, it was just run by normal lay teachers. And uh, then my sister was a teacher, the one I mentioned who was at the whole training college. Oh, yeah. She she became a teacher at a school about three miles, um, three miles away. But that three miles was like uh, like uh, a million miles away. For instance, I was born in a village called Kilray, County Derry. This was in actually in County Antrim. We had to go over the River Ban to it. And uh, she felt that I would have a better chance of passing the 11 plus if I went to her school because the head teacher was a brilliant, brilliant teacher. And so it turned out. So I went there from nine to 11 and passed the 11 plus, probably because of him. Did you want to go? Did you want to leave your mates and go off? To no, I didn't. No, I really did not. No, that's, I say, the three miles. And so it took me a little bit of time to get used to the people from County Antrim. And I lost my friends at uh, at this side. And in many aspects, probably never really regained them. No. What, what Were mum and dad aspirational for you? Because if, if your sister's become a teacher, did they want... Were they... Um, my mother particularly, yeah, felt education was the, was really important and she, uh, she strived uh, oh, endlessly to, 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 get, to, to get things together for us. And uh, when you, if you did the 11 plus, I had two older brothers who went to boarding school in a place in Derry City. And uh, because of that, um, my mother wanted myself, my two younger brothers and uh, to, to follow suit. And so when I passed the 11 plus, even though there was a local, there was a local grammar school just opening nine miles away, which meant I would have been a day boy. She didn't want that. She felt the best teachers would be in St. Columns, certainly early on. Um, uh, and um, early on, I'm, I'm talking about early on in the, in the, the new grammar school yeah. that the teachers would just maybe be thrown together, she thought. So I went to uh, the boarding school for five years and... Um, my brothers at that time had left. They'd gone on to university, but she felt that education was uh, was paramount. Where did that come from, do you think? I'm not sure because she didn't have any education herself. But uh, no, she, I, I don't know what it was. She just a, a driving ambition for her family. And so the education system in Northern Ireland at the time was the same as in, as in Britain? It was, exactly, yes. So um, if you passed 11 plus, what you, you got a scholarship, right. but you still had to pay boarding fees, you know, we have things like this here. So we had to, um, my father had to really work for those, for those boarding fees. It must fees. have been and a stretch then with it so was, many yeah. of you. Yeah, absolutely. What about going away at 11? It's quite young to be a boarder. I, 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 no, I I felt it was too young. Yeah. Uh, I must admit, I was. I, it took you. It took me certainly weeks, weeks on it to uh, to get used to it. Yeah, I was. Um, you know, um, first time that I that I I went there was 1963, and um, I couldn't. I certainly couldn't get used to it at all. You know, missing my two younger brothers and sisters things that get here and just family home and you didn't realise how much you would miss it. But then you start to get used to it, you know, you get into the way of college life. Um, but the coming coming back after Christmas in a, in a cold January morning, back to boarding school again, was the, I think was the most difficult of all. It's you know, brutal, wasn't it? it? It was brutal. And St. Columns was, it was, um, it was, um, what shall I say? It was I, I can't say it was Tom Brown's school days, but it was it was severe. You know, it was pretty 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 tough. Bleak, bleak. So home comforts very thin on the ground. Very much so. And because I I went to boarding school in Yorkshire, run by Benedictine monks, and I, I'm a bit younger than you, so mine was very much the end of an era of of, of you know ranks of metal bed frames. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
about four, th- 23 or four of us to a room. You got, had very little by way of personal space or belongings. You had a chest of drawers and your Sunday suit hanging in the wardrobe, that kind of so thing. So there's about 20 years difference between you and I. So even then it was like that. Was that mm, right? It was okay. the, last, the last sort of hurrah. I've been yeah. back since. Yeah. They've got pizza menus on the notice board. They've all right. got mobile phones. Uh-huh. They've got all right, okay. But yeah, just, just you, right you, at the end, in the middle of the 80s, towards the end of the 80s. And you went you went back, did you? Did you go back as a, as a, an ex-student who had done well? or no, were I'm, you I'm, forgiven I'm, for was, being thrown out? Oh, you've done your research, have you? I, yeah, I know we a go. lot about you. No, uh, no I, I went back still without telling them I was going. I was still banned from the premises, but my wife wanted to see it. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned it because she started crying when she, just when she saw the dormitories. That's why I used the word bleak. Is that yes. people possibly... So you carry this strange thing. I did, certainly. You're carrying your parents' hopes, and obviously your parents were making sacrifices to send you there yep. by, by dint of the fees. And yet at the same time, you, you are suffering. You are feeling this is not right for me, but you can't quite go down that path because of the aspirations that you're carrying and the knowledge that this is what is, in your parents' view, is what is best for you. Yeah, absolutely, yes. And But I think you mentioned earlier, but it's, it's what you knew or what you didn't know. And 11 years of age, I mean, I, funnily enough, I was, uh, my older brothers went to school with uh, Seamus Heaney and John Hume. Really? Uh, yeah. And in fact, John Hume was a teacher, a French teacher in my first year at St. Columns in Derry. My first year. Then he left to go to the fisheries and obviously became, uh, became what he became, which was fantastic. But um, yeah, and I actually, my first, my first year at St. Columns, I had my own cubicle, as it was yeah, called a cubicle. Yeah. And across the corridor from my cubicle was uh, Seamus Heaney's younger brother, Dan Heaney. So uh, yeah, I mean, I... Mean, I I, um, That's amazing. Yeah, it was absolutely. Yeah. Uh, were you academic? Were you were you a bright? I, I wouldn't. I I no. I and I I loved I loved um, history and geography and things like this here. I I must admit, in terms of science and uh, physics and chemistry, um, I'm I was at. Um, you had to sometimes uh, draw the little diagrams for things that you see here. And the electricity, you had a little arrow for the electricity to go in. And I remember, uh, <laughs> I remember Father McCarran, the science teacher, saying to me, hey, son, uh, he said, if that arrow was pointed in the direction that you pointed and you'd blow the place up. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, uh, I, I, I enjoyed certain subjects, I must admit, but, um, but uh, physics and chemistry and science in particular did my brain in. But you put the graph. You you grafted, did you? Were you a hard worker, or did you? Cut? I I I I actually don't think I was because okay. I I grew up. I think you were going to mention. Uh, I I was. We were a big Gaelic family, and uh, my my brothers played Gaelic football uh, for Derry, and obviously the local local town Kilray, and I grew up loving that. Uh, I wanted, but soccer was was something I really, from a very early age, I wanted to do. The minute that that um, I would have said early sixties when uh, not that we saw these games on TV we didn't uh, weren't we didn't uh, ha- we meaning the college didn't didn't allow you to have any television uh, but when I came home and there was uh, periods at Christmas time when match of the day would have been in its infancy at the time then just to just to go to Anfield for one game would have been great for me but I had this I had this longing to be. Uh, a full-time professional player for from a that, long, well, for a, from a long time away. Seriously, from a long time, eleven, twelve, thirteen. My favourite team was Sunderland. Believe it or not, well, most uh, most Irish Catholics would have Celtic, but yeah, if you're talking about an English team, and right. Sunderland were very, very seldom in the um, in the big division. Sure. In fact, they're, they're, they were. It was a struggle for them to get up most of the time. But they had they had a big centre half, an Irish centre half called Charlie Hurley, who was my hero. Right. And I used to, uh, in probably in my science class, when I was woken up with the the uh, the strap uh, for a couple of times for not not knowing my my stuff, then my my dreams would have been heading onto a ship and heading over to. Um, Heading over to Wearside to play for Sunderland. What did your family and friends make of that? It's an odd ambition for from a from I, I a Gaelic th- football family. I think when I made it clear that this is what I wanted to do, I think that there was a feeling. Well, okay, let's see. My mother definitely wanted me to be educated as much as possible, so that if I failed, she might not have had much hope for me as an, as a professional player. <laughs> so that if I failed, I could drop back and and uh, have a, at least some sort of education. Because it wasn't just, I mean, we should probably stress that 
we can talk about it being a Gaelic football family, but the, the O'Neills were Gaelic football royalty, really. Yeah, they were. I mean, I was I was a really good player. At, were you? Uh, yeah, very. But it just very... didn't excite you in the same way that. Oh no, I did. Oh no, I did. Oh, okay. Absolutely did. Yeah, I loved it. I was. Um... I was able to, in my last couple of years at A-level, my family mm. moved up to Belfast in 1968 yeah. uh, when um, uh, Mary Hopkin was number one. <laughs> uh, those were the days. <laughs> and she had just shifted uh, Hey Jude off the top. So I remember those uh, distinctly. So I, I, it was great for me because uh, I became a day boy at a new grammar school, St. Malachy's, right. which allowed me then to go and play for play Gaelic for the, for the college. And also play soccer for uh, for a local um, uh, youth team called Rosario. So, and that's where I actually got picked up. Tell tell us a little bit about the divisiveness of. of I mean, there the, the would be because it came to a bit of a head, didn't it? When when Rosario qualified for a final and the school didn't want to let you play, so that there was a a, a sense that you, it was un Irish somehow to well, play. Well, those th- those were the rules at the time. Yeah, the and it was. Um, it was that you were not allowed to play soccer. If you played soccer, um, you would be banned from playing Gaelic football. And I felt that um, even then, as a schoolboy, I think that you should be able to have played both. But was this a Catholic thing? Was this a this was a Catholic this thing? Was this a, was this a Catholic. Is the, yeah. the, this is a Absolutely. Brit sport. This is Ex- a Brit, right? Absolutely. People will struggle to get yeah. their heads around that. Well, the the irony of all of this is that I was banned from playing. In a uh, in a stadium in Belfast called Casement Park, because um, two colleges teams that we were playing against, uh, I was St Malachy's, the other team were St Mary's. The best venue to play it was uh, was at Casement Park, but they would not allow me to play there because I was playing soccer for a team called Distillery at this time. And uh, the irony of ironies is that Casement Park now at this minute. Is it's it's like a ghost stadium, but it's tr- attempting to be refurbished for the Euros. For oh, the, really? The Gaelic Stadium for the Euros in uh, is it in twenty twenty eight or whatever? How it is. the world turns. Absolutely. So it would almost feel like your Irishness was being questioned. In, uh, I, I think that that uh, absolutely right. Yeah, and uh, and there was no reason for it at all. Uh, I mean, uh, the the rule was there in place at one stage or another. I think uh, uh, for years and years. Uh, and uh, and it was adhered to at the time, but it was. Uh, I, I think re- the realization of it now is that it was. Um, it wasn't the best. Um, it's interesting, this, isn't it? Because I, I trying to work out how good you thought you were. So already you've developed an ambition to play professionally, and and that would involve pretty much moving to to England, uh, moving to yeah to England or Scotland. You you've got. I think as an indication of how good you were might be contained in the fact that they moved the match we're talking about to a venue outside Belfast so that you could play for the for a play for the college team. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean that I have great memories of playing for the college team. We had reached the All Ireland final the previous year and uh, we got beaten in the final by a team called Colossus Christ Re in, in from Cork. But this was played in Dublin Stadium. And I, I loved it, and I loved playing for uh, a Derry minor team. Uh, so that would be under 18s. Mm. I played, I played in that team for a couple of years. I love Gaelic, and I still do, and I think, and I follow it. But um, I mean, it was an amateur game at the yeah. time. Well, that, so it's and not that's a career. Is it, it wasn't it's, a career, no. absolutely. So the, the the sights are now set on a career, and yeah, exactly, you, but but with the fallback position of a law degree. So I, I, attempting to do I, exactly that. But you have a passion for the law. Where did that come from? I that that probably came. Uh, I think there are there there are two aspects to it. I think in nineteen um, nineteen sixty two. Uh, I was 10 years of age mm. and uh, there was um, a lad called James Hanratty who was hanged for the murder of um, uh, the murder of a fellow called Michael Gregson and uh, and the rape of Valerie Story, an attempted murder of her, always protesting his innocence. This was in and Slough. This was, yeah, the, the pick-up point was in Slough. The, the murder actually took place in um, between... Um, between Luton and Bedford right. in a place called Dead Man's Hill, almost halfway between the two spots. Okay. And um, he had always uh, maintained his innocence right to the very, very end. And the name Hanratty, a very unusual name, 
and uh, he was of Irish descent. Uh, his father was very, very Irish, uh, living in the Kilburn area, I think, at the time. Mm. And uh, and obviously he wanted to try and clear his son's name for years and years and years. And um, in a way back, that was in 62. And my mother, and <clears throat> remember in those days, there might have been just two TV channels, a, a, a recent addition to our, to our family to have the TV at the time. And of course, despite the fact of us being in Ireland, this was uh, this was national news, and so on, and it was getting a lot of traction at the time, uh, considering that that um, that the police had asked for a different fellow first of all to give himself up, a fellow called Peter Alphon. Anyway, so my interest took play, took took You're quite young partic- to be captured by a- this sort of absolutely. story. Absolutely, and um, and I know that uh, that was 1962. Yeah. So in a boarding school, I remember. About I think it was about 1965, 66, the Sunday Times were doing a big uh, article on this. And I noticed that um, in my English class, the English teacher, Mr. Keevney, actually had the Sunday Times and had the, um, had the supplement there. And the supplement was dealing with the case. And I'm trying to read it upside down because <laughs> I have this real great yeah. interest in, in, in the case. Anyway, as it turns out, um, the, the interest probably stemmed from then. And uh, why do you think that captured your imagination so much? I, I, th- I think for for someone to to maintain one's innocence right to the very end, even to, uh, and and say to the father, "Listen, you you've got to clear my name, even when I'm not here, even anymore. when I'm not here." And the again, I, I mentioned the word irony, but it is worthwhile that in about 1969, so fast forward about five or six, seven years, uh, James Henratty's father is in Marble Arch holding mm. up a placard saying his son was in Rill at the time. Who's standing beside him helping offer him? But John Lennon. <laughs> John Lennon's there with him. So That's the crazy. case had taken uh, a great became deal of a course celebrity, didn't Absolutely. It? But never, it was never resolved. It, it, well, in a sense, it has been resolved because they actually found a little bit of DNA and the, and uh, they dug up um, Hanrati's body and I think there seemed to be that he was guilty. Um, uh, obviously, much to my great disappointment, but um, I think that was the case. I know there's arguments about cross-contamination and all that type of stuff, which may or may not have taken place, but there's certainly um, certainly more evidence to suggest that he might have done it. So you are 18, you want to be a footballer. Mm-hmm. Your mum presumably says you better go to university to have something to fall back on if mm-hmm. the football doesn't work out. Yeah. So law is the obvious. It's not, it's, it, well, it's, it's not something obvious. I wanted to do. Yeah, yeah I, di- I did. Um, I wasn't there that long. I was because the football took because off. Because of the football, mm. and I, I was playing for this team called Distillery. Play, they were semi-professional in the Irish league. What did that mean? That meant, that meant most of the most of the lads had other jobs. Absolutely, absolutely. But if you could win what was called the Irish Cup or the league, it got you into European football. Yes, and we did win the Irish Cup. Beat Derry con- City as a consequence. Yeah, and funnily enough, in the Derry City team were two of my uh, schoolmates. Really? Against, I was playing against them, <laughs> believe it or not. And um, so we, as a consequence, we were drawn against Barcelona. But this is incredible, really. Yeah. So how, what would be the average gate for a distillery? A uh, distillery's gate at that time, remember, troubles now, right? Course, this is yeah, where, yeah, this course. is 19, this would be 1971. 71. Yeah. And uh, troubles rife in in, uh, in Northern Ireland, but particularly in Belfast and in Derry City. Mm. And um, so our, our crowds that should really have been anything around about 5,000 people would maybe maybe down to about three or something like that, you know. And there was obviously a a massive drop off in that. And uh, even in the even the cup final, which would normally attract uh, maybe 17, 20,000 people, I think there was only about 6,000 at the final because, uh, again, it was played at a place called Windsor Park, which would be considered a a Protestant, uh, uh, the home of Linfield football uh, team, which would be Protestant and distillery would be considered a half Catholic, half Protestant, but Derry City, very much a Catholic side. So there was only about 6,000 people at the game because of, because of the trouble. 
And Barcelona at the time were one of the biggest clubs in the and world. Barcelona. So what was so that I, like? That must have been a bit of a moment. That for was you. fantastic <laughs> to actually score a goal. I know against, you did. Well, yeah. you scored, we should say you scored two against Derry City to qualify I, yeah. for it, and then and you I got one against, against Barcelona. Barcelona. And because of that, the the game against Derry City wouldn't attract national attention or anything like this year. But uh, there was uh, a great deal of traction over over the goal against Barcelona. And within a couple of weeks, I was uh, I was I'd gone from being. Um, uh, just a student at university uh, to being a professional footballer, essentially overnight. But but on the books at Forest at Nottingham Forest, yes. correct? Sorry. Um, what about just but briefly? How, how else did the troubles impact on your your life at that time? I'd, well, great, greatly, I suppose. But um, the fact that um, that I suppose I I left in in um, in nineteen seventy one. This was uh, this would be about October of 1971. Internment set set in in uh, in August of 1971. So it was it was pretty ferocious, and uh, so much so that uh, there was an opportunity uh, for my family to move over to England. At the time, I I, I did want that, but I probably. Because at that time, time there were statistically speaking, there were about five girls in Nottingham to every fellow. So I thought, <laughs> I thought to myself, I I would like to, I I should be okay because I'm also a professional footballer as well. Too didn't necessarily happen in the in the manner in which I uh, was suggesting, but even so, it was um, it was eventually an opportunity for for my mother and father and siblings to move over. So, so they all came, or the younger they, the siblings, ones that, the, the, mum and the dad, younger element, all yeah, moved over they, as they well. Came over, yeah. Because you were earning such a good wage, or, or? not? That's the whole point: is that I wasn't earning no. such a great wage. I was, I obviously as a student, I was earning uh, no money at all. Sure, um, I was given a little bit of a uh, bit of expenses when I was playing for a distillery, but then I I get this wage. But uh, I, I would like to, uh, of course, memory plays tricks with you, but I I. I would have thought the 1971-72 that the uh, whatever you were earning uh, was being um, well uh, taken up by the tax man. I think that I yeah. think we're that, back to uh, John Lennon. I think yeah, <laughs> I, well done. I think we're going back to like like eighty odd percent. Yeah, and 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 you're that generation, aren't you? Who who didn't see as a player who didn't see any of the silly money. I think younger people find this quite hard to understand. I, I mean. People would go go and get jobs after playing football. In fact, you did briefly, didn't you, in Nottingham after after you after you'd retired from playing football? I, th th this is <clears throat> excuse me. This is the point. Despite the fantastic success of, of Nottingham Forest, of which I was a part, mm -hmm. and um, and delighted to be so, we were earning more money at that stage than the normal man in the street. I accept this, but never enough to to retire on. And um, with, uh, as I said to you, with uh, tax being so high, yeah. it was never that. Uh, and I got lucky in many aspects because eventually I became a football manager in a time when money was getting better. Yes. Nothing really like the type of money that's been earned now, but I got a second chance, whereas some of the other players who were terrific footballers did not have that there and had to end up working for a living after playing football. Yeah, and, and still, I mean, they'll turn up on match days at big clubs, won't they, and, and do a bit of ambassadorial work. Absolutely. And and the money is useful. Uh, 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 absolutely. I don't know if you ever knew my godfather, Martin Leach, who was the News of the World's correspondent. Yeah, of course, Did yes. you know my uncle Martin? No, no, no yeah. is that right? Yeah, he's my godfather. So I didn't know that. I'd sometimes answer the phone. In fact, so my dad was a, 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 basically an industrial correspondent on the Telegraph. So if I answered the phone at my house, it might be Arthur Scargill on the phone or someone like mm -hmm. that, and I'd have to take a message and always a journalist's son. Seriously? If I answered the phone at my, my Uncle Martin's house in Stockport, it could be Kenny Dalglish on the other end of the line no. or, yeah, or Ian Rush or someone like that. But I do remember some of his contacts from Liverpool's great heyday around the same time as Forrest's were, were on their uppers. Uh, Absolutely. Subsequently. Yes. Yeah, I, mean, I always found it hard to get my head around. Yes. The the, the answer is yes. It, uh, I mean, we we were we are winning the same competitions as as the as present day players are are attempting to win at the minute. But the money was not there. Just as simple as that. It wasn't there. So seventy one. You, I mean, did it? Well, t tell me a little bit about the moment when the scout sort of what, knocked on the dressing room door, or did he come and meet your parents? How how did that work? How did you get signed for Forest? 
Uh, right. Okay. So I've been playing about a year for for distillery. We had we'd won the cup, as I mentioned. We had uh, so about uh, September time, I'd scored this goal against Barcelona, <laughs> and um, and then Northern Ireland had a, an international game against Russia at Windsor Park, and um, and the player manager of. Uh, of Northern Ireland at the time was also player manager of Hull City and his name was Terry Neal who ended up being a manager of Arsenal for quite a number of years and a few players pulled out of the squad through injury and instead of bringing some players from England he decided to go with this up and coming player from uh, from um, from distillery and I got picked into the squad so I had a couple of days with the with the team learning uh, just uh, Learning uh, as much as I could from from seasoned professional players like uh, like Pat Rice, who had just won the double with Arsenal, Sammy Nelson as well too, uh, players like that. And George Best, of course, was in his heyday at the time. He didn't he didn't turn up for that particular game. <laughs> I know you're going to say what a surprise, yeah. but he didn't do for the game. I got an opportunity to come on with 20 minutes to go against Russia. I never got a kick, but it didn't matter. But the well, non- literally, never that on, literally didn't get a kick. But the 20 minutes that I was on at least alerted uh, the the attention of the Nottingham Forest um, manager who happened to be at the game, right. Matt Gillies, the Scotsman. And um, but Terry Neal was the one who initiated initiated things because he, after that Wednesday afternoon game. And it was the last game Northern Ireland were to play at Windsor Park for about four years mm. because of the troubles. But um, so what happened is that Terry Neal said, I want you to continue your education, but I would like to put a bid in for you to go to Hull. And of course, Hull with my my sister having been to Hull, and I, you know, this is that would be great. He put a bid in of £10,000. Nottingham Forest up to £15,000 on a Tuesday evening. I was told this by Distillery Board. And uh, I, so I had to sign professional forms for distillery on thir- on Tuesday night. Of course, and then to I, be sold. To be sold. And I flew to, uh, I flew second time ever in a plane. I flew to uh, to East Midlands Airport on the uh, on the Wednesday morning. And did it live up to your expectations from the very start when you got professional there? football? Yeah. Ah. Uh, it's it's everything. It's absolutely everything. It's a new life. It's a new change. It was everything. I I within three or four weeks I scored. I have this joke where I say I scored on my debut. I um, about five six weeks later in the at Old Trafford I come on as a sub against George Best, Bobby Charlton, and Dennis Law and score. And I thought, this is just an easy life. This is, <laughs> this is an easy life. And I, I do make the joke. I said, well, I, unfortunately, I hit a bad spell. It lasted about four and a half years. And I think, so... Uh, Forrest I mean, got relegated, didn't they, at the Forrest end of that season? Forrest got relegated. Season. Please yeah. don't blame me for that. I played 10 <laughs> games for them during the course and getting used to life as a professional player. But yes. uh, no, it's uh, absolutely, it's... Uh, uh, I, I, Obviously, to be a professional golfer or tennis player, something that you do on your own, where it's all about it's you, it's you in the moment. But to 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 actually be in a team sport, and uh, and to to share great moments with teammates, I think is just nothing fantastic. I'm saying this, but had had let's say by 1975, I'm now a professional for about three and a half years or whatever the case may be. And it has been a bit of a struggle, real struggle. It's been, oh, some managers liking you, other man- managers leaving, and then new managers coming in and not liking you, all that type of stuff. And uh, so Brian Clough arrives, changes or changes the course of, of the club's history. The next five years have just been sensational, absolutely. Beyond so, your wildest beyond dreams. Beyond your wildest yeah. dreams to win the European Cup twice and things like this here. But if, if, if just say, for instance, if I'd picked up an injury, by 1975, you might be asking me a different question. Was it worth it? Was yeah. it worth, what would you have been doing? Would you have gone back to Ireland again, try to finish your law degree? I just don't know. So sometimes along the way, you get a little bit of luck. And the luck, the luck came with Brian Clough arriving at the football club. Why was he so he was, instrumental? And, well, and was it immediately clear what a one-off he was? I've got to tell you this. Yeah. I, think I can you, listen to Brian Clough stories all day long. You <laughs> would have really enjoyed him. He was terrific. So. And um, you would have even accepted the fact that he called you young man. Young man. You know, young man. <laughs> he said, 
Now, now I might not know <laughs> your profession as well as you do, son, but don't talk to me about football. <laughs> so that's the best I can do, and it's not great. But, uh, yeah, I had, I, I must admit I had uh, for uh, seemingly a long time, uh, you know, fights with him, fights mm. and to try and prove him wrong rather than right as much as anything else, but it was worth it. Whether he felt that that was the best of, or th that he felt that that was the best way of getting the best out of me, I, I don't know. Sometimes I could have done with it with just a slightly bit more praise than, okay. than yeah. but all of those things, as most people do. But overall, if you had said to me, 1975, by the way, you're going to have a really tough time with him, but you're going to survive the cull, which there's going to be because he's going to get rid of a lot of players and that you will, by the turn of the, uh, the next decade, you will have been involved in a championship winning team, a League Cup winning side a couple of times, and a European Cup for the second successive year. I think it would have taken that. And and the board had a bit gave him his head, didn't they? They gave him a couple of years to get promoted. There wasn't it, the... well. It's a very good point you make. A very good point. I, I was Cl a Forest fan at the time. Oh, uh, seriously? Yeah. Well, when he came across, and I was born in Derby. I was adopted in Nottingham. Yeah. So when Clough moved from Derby to Nottingham, it felt that my loyalty should move with him. And so oh, I, 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 sorry, that yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, I must yeah. admit, you know, I sorry. I'm more I, of a kid Mr. Harriers man right. these days, but at the right. time, Forest were my my team. I didn't know when the so, FA Cup so game against Wolves. Born in Derby. And yeah, adopted in Nottingham. Adopted in Nottingham yeah, yeah. from the family O'Brien. I, I they, just they, no, they adopted me. They're, yes, so, that's so, what I'm saying. Yeah, that's yes. right. Yeah. So I assume I'm Irish, Irish, but adopted and biological. Oh, I. Yeah. Oh, so you know that? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, fine. Yeah. Oh, I understand. That. Double Sorry, bubble. I, so I wasn't. I, I wasn't <laughs> sure. What part of Ireland is it? Wexford. Wexford. Mm. Down Wexford. Mm. Good lord, you know. So 1898 rebellion and all yeah, that. That's yeah, that's <laughs> So. Um, but um, uh, where was I? Just lost my train of thought. Okay, I just say I, the, the, yeah. the, the board gave him time to actually get the they did because club we, in. we won our first two games. Mm. After that, we went. I think it was about eighteen matches without winning, and uh, only Brian Clough would have survived that. Yeah, but um, although was, not at Leeds, <laughs> I didn't do it at Leeds because that was a different ball game. Of course it was. No, of course Absolutely. it was. With respect to Nottingham Forest at the time, we were as Brian Clough called us a two-bit club with two-bit <laughs> players going nowhere. What a motivator. But, yes. Whereas at, at, uh, Leeds, at Leeds United, you had to be, they had yeah. the, the best side in of the country course. at the time. Yes. You know? and, and it was very difficult. And when you, when you tell the, the Leeds players that they should throw their medals in the bin because they've cheated in the championship, it's not going to go down too well when you become their manager. No, it's not. Um, did you know quite quickly that that this was a very special era, even before promotion in 77. Did, did you know that he was different from... Because you'd had a few managers by this point. Did you know that he was different from other managers? Uh, yeah, yeah, but he had already earned his reputation at the time because he had been manager at Derby County... And Peter Taylor County, was with him as and well. And Peter Taylor yeah. was with him. Where he had struggled early on um, at Nottingham Forest was not having Peter Taylor with him. Right. And that sounds it sounds a wee bit strange, isn't it? Really, to see to see this charismatic man that 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 fears nothing, but yet, funnily enough, did need Peter Taylor with him. That's why that drama was so compelling. I yes, think, because oh, did, it did you enjoy that? that? Yeah, did I did. You? I really I, did. I, I did. I I I thought that um, I thought that there were some great moments in it. I'm not so sure that Brian Clough eventually went down in the hands and knees at Brighton to bring to beg Peter Taylor to come back in the manner in which they did. <laughs> However, yeah, I, I I don't disagree with you as a as a as a piece of film. I I thoroughly enjoyed it. So you you I, I don't I don't yet have a sense, or I don't know yet whether you expected success or, 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 or I mean were you an ambitious player were, were you happy just to be playing for a, for a big oh, club or no, did you you no. wanted no you set out you yeah. set out every 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 budding player from 11 years of age I'm quite sure must set out to think to want to win you've got to win Good. and to win the, trophies and, and medals to win trophies and, yes, yes. absolutely that's what I mean you have to win and the games the games pointless if you're not winning it really is pointless and I do feel for some great great players who have been terrific terrific individually terrific but have not been in a side that has won things and they do have regrets about that 
And I certainly cannot have any regrets about things that have been won. I mean, to, to win the European Cup that belonged to either the Celtic team of 67 yeah. or, or George Best, Bobby Charlton, or Topuskas and De Stefano. Sorry, that's, you don't get any better. I'm going to indulge myself here, even if some people listening may not share my interest or my excitement. That the, the, I mean, once was extraordinary. But twice was just not in any script at all, really, was it? I mean, that was absolutely unbelievable. Not. Unbelievable, yeah, exactly. To to um, the first, in of course, in those days, you had to win the league to get into the European Cup, and therefore, and the only other way of getting into it for the following years by actually winning the European Cup itself. <laughs> okay, so we won the league, and what do you want? What are you looking for? You're looking for a European venture, aren't you? What were we? We were drawn against Liverpool in the first leg, and and the chances of us knocking Liverpool, although we had the Indian sign over them for a couple of years at yes. the time, I'd have said our chances were pretty slim. But we did it. We managed to do it, and um, and and from then on in, we felt as if we had a chance. Um, we um, we had some some difficult moments along the way. But um, but we managed it in the first year. Then the second year, defending it was uh, again extremely difficult, but we saw it through. And we, you were injured for the for the first got, final, right? I got injured three weeks beforehand, as did a fellow called Archie Gemmel. Never heard, a heard of him. Wonderful, never heard of him. Of course, Darby, <laughs> you're talking about wonderful football, Archie, and, and um, uh, just brilliant that he came to to Forest. Um, but um, the two of us had picked up injuries a couple of weeks beforehand that we had done very, very little training. In fact, my first training session three weeks, be, uh, having picked up the injury three weeks before the, the final of the European Cup was a Monday evening in Munich just before setting out. So if I was a manager, I would be concerned about somebody declaring himself fit when he hadn't done the training. And the same with Archie. Although Archie, I think, had been promised by Brian Clough. I didn't know this until, until quite recently when I was speaking to Archie, that he had actually been promised that he would be in the team and uh, for a number of reasons. One, he was good enough to be in the side. Two, he had had a great relationship with Brian Clough at Derby County. He'd been great for, for it. And so you, you, I can understand that. I was not given any such promises. Well. There. But as it turns out, the both of us, Clough did say that he could not go into, into Frank Clark also had picked up a bit of an injury, but was less severe than us two. And Brian Clough, quite rightly as a manager, said, I cannot go into a European Cup final with two players who have done very little training. So we were on the bench. And of course, you are not part of this. You do not feel part of it at all. Do you when, not at all? Absolutely not. Bridesmaid. A, it doesn't matter whether you've been involved in a semi-final, two semi-finals against uh, Cologne, who were a sure. brilliant team yeah. at the time. That's... That, that's it's like Jimmy Greaves in 66, isn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. You're just not Abs there. You're not there. Yeah. You're not there. And the unfortunate thing about Archie is that Archie left to go to, to Birmingham City during the summer, the, the that, that, that later summer, or as... You know, dis disappointed and all as I was not to play in the final. I'm back at the football club, and of course, to play in the next, to play in the final against Hamburg in Real Madrid Stadium was just, just it can't get any better at club level. Did did any of the family get to that game? Yeah, oh, oh absolutely. A whole lot of them. Yeah, pretty much. Of course. Um, I mean, what, what what was that like? What was the relationship? Like by then, you, you were a superstar. No, the, the relationship, I thought you were going to say about the relationship with myself and Brian Clough. Brian Clough actually uh, praised me in the final uh, at half time in the game. Gosh, did I not feel like running running forever and Well, there ever it is then. That's why That's it works. Because it. finally, it's like... Yeah, a... uh, absolutely. And um, <laughs> so it was great. Um, we had uh, we had a strange sort of build up to the to the final where we had spent a week in Mallorca with no curfew, whereas the um, the um, Hamburg side with Kevin Keegan as uh, pretty well close to maybe his third consecutive European player of the year or whatever the case may be, they were ensconced in some training camp. And there's us about 10 days before the final uh, out, out in Mallorca with no curfew. So Brian Clough was, um, there's no question about it, he did have some um, uh, some unorthodox methods <laughs> about coaching, but his record is there for all to see, and he was absolutely fantastic. Absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, and, he was. I mean, and, and you're near the end of your Forest career by the time you pick up that second Yeah, well, I was, European yeah, that's cup. right. I was but I, I just want to talk, we'll have a quick look at what, what happened after that, but let's talk a little bit about Northern Ireland, the highlight, I suppose, captaining 
the team at the World Cup in 82. 82 was terrific. Yeah, absolutely. So you're leading Northern Ireland out into a World Cup. In the world, yes, we qualified and um, they're in, um, we were in uh, in the same group as the host nation, Spain. Who you beat. Uh, that we beat to, to get through to what was to be a uh, um, round robin quarter final. So we're in the quarter final. But that was amazing because uh, after the match is over in uh, Valencia, we go back to hot- our hotel and having to wait on. Uh, on lads doing drug tests and stuff like this here probably probably went back to the hotel to maybe close to about half past two in the morning but uh, it was full of Northern Ireland supporters and we are absolutely fine and they were joining in and um, but then Billy Bingham our manager came down to gather us all in to tell us that instead of heading to Madrid for the uh, for the next game against Austria which would be in about four or five days time no there was no flight to take us there because the uh, Irish FA thought that we weren't going to qualify. So they had, bu- <laughs> so they had, bu- they had booked us on a flight back to Belfast. <laughs> so we had to we had to scramble and get a get a flight. But who cares? You know, I'm I just thinking it. over about what Roy Keane would have thought. Of yeah, that. Well, that's, so was I uh, actually. Believe it or not, Roy Roy packed it in because the bibs hadn't turned up. <laughs> They're making a film about that. I saw so that. Yes, so that'd have. be an interesting that, one. That right? will be. <laughs> I wonder who's um, going to uh, play Roy. Yes, here, you, you, first Irish Catholic to captain the, the Northern Irish. Side. It was, yeah. That that uh, and again in uh, '82, uh, still the troubles were were uh, rife, and um, that when Billy Bingham made that announcement in the first place, telling me. I said, "Are you sure, Billy? Because I know I think I had lots of experience of with European football with Nottingham Forest. It might have been an easier decision for him to have chosen maybe a Protestant for for being the captain, but he wanted me to do it. It didn't necessarily go down too well at the beginning, but I remember Billy Bingham saying to me, he said, "Listen, if we start to win football matches, this will this will it'll not disappear, but it'll lessen, and that's exactly what happened." Um, at, at club level, you leave Forest, you move around a bit. Uh, supposed to go to Norwich, go to City. Mm-hmm. City doesn't work out with John Bond. Back to Norwich, then I think County. You move back to Nottingham. Yeah, Ch- um, Chesterfield. That was, yeah, no, Ch- well, Chesterfield. I didn't. I, I know it's uh, stuck to. down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was. I picked up. Your knee was troubling I, my you knee, by now. My knee uh, had gone, and in those days, uh, uh, anterior crucial ligament injuries were um, not just career threatening, but probably career ending. Um, but it's a like, lot. It's a long realization. I mean, I think you kept your hopes up for about a year that you might make. I, a I, I did. I should have. I actually should have done. I should have done more. I should have had. I'd played in a number of games for Northern Ireland and we were in a decent enough qualif- qualifying position to go to Mexico in mm. 86. Um, but the injury took place in, in, in 85. And if I'd known that Northern Ireland would probably still go on to do it, then that would have given me the full year to do it. Right. By the time by the time that I tried to get fit without the operation, which was very difficult, it kept breaking down, It was it was too late. What's that like, Martin? That knowledge that you've come to the end of the rainbow of, of this dream career. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's. Um, I used to think that I should be able to get over that pretty quickly. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Yeah. It took me a long time to do so. Couldn't couldn't come to terms with it at all. Um, head all over the place. Uh, Realisation that I just waking up in the morning. What day I waking up to? I'm not going down to a training session. I'm not keeping myself fit. I'm not joining in with anything. And uh, yeah, it is a, it's a pretty, pretty drab. Well, drab would be even the wrong word to use. It was just a, a, a kind of lonely existence, I must admit. Uh, really, at that time, I have um, I have two children, uh, very, very young. I've got a wife who's uh, empathetic, not necessarily always sympathetic, but um, but... Uh, And essentially, just the point that you mentioned earlier on about some players, really essentially no money. Mm. And I I want to do something. And a long road ahead of you with a young family. A long long road ahead. Thoughts of going back to become a a lawyer, not at all. That's like like three years out of your life. I couldn't do it. I, you know, wouldn't have. And uh, no, so, and something that I'd never really thought about at all, going into management. And all the advice I used to give to other other players about things, uh, I never took myself. I never took this advice. And so suddenly now I'm, I'm in an absolute vacuum. I don't know where I'm going. 
and uh, and, and I'm I'm 30 30 32 33 years of age at the time and um yeah so it took me a lot longer to get over it than I should have done than it Do you think it's harder for goal scorers? Do you think that that moment of when you've that, that high is is a higher high than other players get and then when you know that that's over forever. Well, it's... you've just put that to me now and I never thought about that. Something Lineker said to me a while ago made me think about that. Actually, right. While you... Well, I, n- I never thought about it until you yeah. just mentioned that. I thought as a, if you're a professional player and you've reached the sure. heights, if you've re- if you've never reached the heights, then okay, it's not so not so bad. Listen yeah, yeah. here, it yeah. was just it was a career, it was a fulfilment of something, it was something you wanted to do. But if you have reached big heights mm. and you have and big big moments, and knowing that they they will never happen again for you, I think that's that's difficult to get over. So I I, I and maybe. maybe Maybe that might be a point. Goal scores who have that 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 feeling of 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 total exhilaration when they score a goal. Yeah, that 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 might be right. I haven't thought about it, but uh, yeah. But that, I'll, yeah. I'll leave you with that thought. Then you can yeah, take that's, that one. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, it's a good thought. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the pensions industry's loss was Grantham Town's gain. Right. Okay. So I went. I got a knock on the door. Um, I was um, at home. Uh, this lad, who was a director of Grantham Town, uh, knocked on my door and said, um, would you have any interest in becoming the manager of Grantham? Now, the only famous thing, uh, there were two things about Grantham. One, Maggie Thatcher, obviously, <laughs> from there. And two, I think Sir Isaac Newton might have come from, mm. from Grantham. Mm. So anyway, Grantham is about 20, about 22, 23 miles from Nottingham. It's not a big distance. So um, I did do the interview with the Grantham board. It was two nights a week on a Saturday. I asked them which league they were in. They were about seven leagues below the football league. So it's not exactly going to uh, get uh, get major headlines or things like this here. But I thought, OK, well, let, 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 let me let me throw myself into this okay. and see how. Yeah. And and I did I did enjoy it. And interestingly, I I used to bring some ex players down to play for me. So I brought John Robertson, John, yeah. the great John Robertson. John was running a pub at the time, uh, not too far away from that place called As Lockton, which is only not. And John came to play for me. Unbelievably, did not do well. Really? No, couldn't cope with it. John had maybe, maybe might have put on a pound or two, sure. but he hadn't lost his ability. It was just that no one could get him the ball, right. and John wasn't the best when he didn't have it. And then I brought other players down. I brought uh, a lad from the PFA, Mickey Maguire, that I used to play with at Norwich, who did wonderfully well. And I'm paying Mickey thirty-five pounds, <laughs> thirty-five pounds to come to Grantham to play for Grantham. And I thought if I, and then I, I saw a lad playing uh, a game, signed him on, uh, called Gary Crosby, who ended up having a great career at Nottingham Forest. He played eight games for us, seven of which he won on his own. <laughs> and uh, and we sold him to Nottingham Forest. So I realised then, I, uh, l- listen, this is it. This is something I want to do. You took to it very I, quickly. I took to it. I took to and it. then the ambition kicks in as well. And the ambition kicked in. I got an opportunity, second opportunity to become the manager of of uh, uh, Wickham Wonders, uh, who were in what was called the Vauxhall Conference, one, one only below. one league below the yeah. Football League, with all ambition to try and get into the Football League. And I took that chance. Um, and... You did in '94, come up via the playoffs, mm-hmm. and then Norwich come knocking. Yep, latterly, Leicester mm-hmm. um, promotion again. You're a successful manager, a very successful manager. But I think it's 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 the move to Celtic that is seminal. Uh, yeah, well, it probably is because I was after a really difficult start at Leicester, where the crowd were baying for blood. I was able to turn that round, and I two league cups, uh, two league cups. Top 10, we were in three League Cup finals, two of which we won. One, we got beaten by Tottenham in the third one and never out of the top 10 when we got promotion for four consecutive years. So I was really loving it there. And uh, and uh, opportunity to manage other teams, which I turned down. But I, I suppose this was at Celtic. We're looking for a new manager in the year 2000. And I remember my father always saying, have you ever got an opportunity to play for Celtic take it? And uh, so, second best thing, if you can't play for Celtic, let's go and manage them. And you did. And you got a treble in your first season. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of hard to follow. It's very difficult to follow. I must admit, Rangers at that time were very, very strong. And um, 
and we had uh, I inherited a couple of really good players uh, Henrik Larsson being yeah, one of them of I also helped him out immensely by signing some good players as well too and uh, and all together big big effort but we were able to uh, to overthrow Rangers it's a, it's a funny business management much more than playing isn't it the paths not taken mm. in management are a lot more there's many more of them than there are when you're playing the jobs you nearly got you were interviewed for the yeah. England yeah. job you uh, I think when Steve McLaren got it yeah. the the, um, the 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 satisfaction of winning is it the same as when you're a player it's a very good point if there's such a thing as having a a, a different a different satisfaction I mean, as a as a player the the, the game's about playing it's really about playing, regardless of what these managers tell you now. It's about playing. Yeah, yeah. It's what you it's what you set out to do. And there's nothing there was no greater feeling as a player than to to hear that final whistle in nineteen eighty and hoist the European Cup aloft. That was terrific and it's great. And you're sharing it with your, your buddies, your your pals, everything about it is really great. And you're young as well yeah, too. Of course. And yeah. you're and you of course you're going to remain twenty six for the rest of your life, aren't you? You know, it's your, life is not going to change. No, so it's suddenly, yes. Yeah. So as a manager, as a manager, it's a different feeling. And it is this feeling. It is if you have won a cup or a competition or a league, it's it's a team that you've built. Yeah. You've built. You've you've had some sort of vision. I did some. I, I'm pleased. I'm not talking about you know a Guardiola vision or whatever mm, the case may be mm. or whatever. But you've had from the outset. You've you've set out a goal. You've got players to believe in you, and you've got players to play for you, which is the most important thing. And as a combination, a culmination of all of that, there is that you win. And yes. I think it's just if if there's such a sorry if there's such a thing as a different type of satisfaction then that that's it does that am i explaining that, that's that a brilliant answer yeah so so you can't compare it I, i'm not i'm not absolutely but yeah it yeah, somehow it, absolutely reaches and parts even, that other successes don't reach absolutely yes and even though i'm saying it's all about players the game is about players there, there is there is an enormous satisfaction of being the manager there of must a team be. that's won something like an yeah. architect looking at a house uh, absolutely you didn't build well you did build it as well i suppose absolutely but, but that, so um People now familiar with with the the career trajectory of the, of the Celtic, um, Villa, Sunderland, and then a stint as manager of the Republic. Mm -hmm. uh, was that an easy decision to um, make? It it was an easy decision to make in the sense that I was um, uh, I was uh, a player for Northern Ireland, but I was a, a, a Catholic um, captain of the team, but yet. To manage the Republic of Ireland was was it, it was it wasn't a problem because a big a big contingent of uh, uh, Republic of Ireland supporters would be Celtic supporters yes, as course. well too. So I never Lovely. felt that 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 was but still a sense of being an outsider, a bit like what what Billy Bingham said to you. Oh uh, right, okay. if you do well. I I did. I did. Feel, no, that was mainly through the press. Right. I didn't get on too well with a lot of the journalists there. Yeah. I didn't help myself a great deal. I must admit, you know, like any, <laughs> any anything else, you know, can be a bit cantankerous rather. And I didn't help and didn't. Uh, I didn't impress them in that sense. No, I'd never felt that from the crowd. You know, we had the crowds. Uh, uh, Roy Keane was my assistant yeah. manager, and the two of us. Uh, we won through and got to um, to France in in twenty sixteen into the Euros into and the that, knockout stages. And, well. And and even I think as recently as recently as the Euros, I believe I didn't see it, but I I, I was told that Roy had said still one of the big highlights of his yes. glittering career, yes. and he was the assistant manager. So I I felt that um, I I absolutely loved it. It was great, and to be there and to actually to to beat Italy on the on, on a game up in um, up in uh, where was it up in uh, was it in Lille. Um, where we won to 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 qualify for the last sixteen of the competition was just extraordinary, and just that that some of my friends who were from the Republic of Ireland 
and a couple of them were at a race meeting that night, wherever it was. And they, uh, when um, when the news had come through that Brady had scored the goal, goal and that yeah. we had won, I mean, the, the 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 jumping around at the race course was absolutely phenomenal. So those type of things that uh, th- listen, they're 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 worth they're worth. You've, you've had you've got you've got a, a, a cabinet full of memories, haven't you? As well as, as as well as trophies, but I suppose in a way the final one is quite a sad one. When when you have a crack at Forest, it felt like destiny, and you didn't really have the support of the. Of the board, the owners, the football's changed a lot if, since you first arrived at Forest. Absolutely right. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I had the opportunity to manage them a couple of times, and I turned it down a few. Uh, but this time, I, I, I spoke to John Robertson. John said, uh, John, who lives in Nottingham at the time, and John, um, who had actually fallen out of love with football himself, which was kind of sad. Uh, John said, I think this is it, Martin. You know, I think this is the time to take the job. So I'm not I'm f- far from blaming John. But <laughs> absolutely not. He's getting no, his revenge for did. Grantham. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I um, I took it on. Um, I did say to the owner of the football club, who's still the owner of the club, I said to him that, listen, all I wanted was the, uh, I came in January, mid-January, and I just wanted the extra, the that season and the next season, and if I couldn't get up, so I only signed for the eighteen months, saying if I couldn't get up, well, I'll, I'll, I'll make, I'll, uh, I'll say goodbye to the football club, and and let someone else and have a go. And if I'd, I'd love to have thought that if I could have had that opportunity of done that there, then that something might have happened. Anyway, that's that's my, I had nineteen games in charge. The last three of which we won at the back end of the season, we didn't get into the playoffs. But I was really looking forward to the new season. Yeah. When um, when uh, I'd done one week of pre-season, then uh, the chief executive, who was a Greek, and um, and the director of football, who was also a Greek, pulled me into the room to say, "The way you run the football club is not the way we want to run it," and that was it. And uh, and I well when they've made their minds up about that there. I never actually got to find out what they meant by it. It didn't really matter. No, that had gone. It's their train set, and isn't it? Absolutely. But the interesting thing about it is that, so I sat down in the room. I told my coaching staff that uh, we are jobless. you know. And <laughs> 24 minutes later, uh, Nottingham Forest, 24 minutes later, they announced uh, a new manager. So, and I hadn't even left the little room. Now, I don't mind it goes on in the game, but sure. please al- allow me to at least get home before dignity, you make yeah, the announcement. It's just courtesy, isn't but it? But that's it. So when you, when you left the city ground that day, did did you think to yourself, that's it? Did you think I'm probably not going gonna... I, I, It's a good point. I No, I, I probably didn't do. COVID was on its way at that course, time. Yeah. And for a man of my age, I think that that was a, a couple of years that you don't get back. Mm. And I think mm. as time uh, time presses on, so there was very little football at, the, at, at that stage and then played behind closed doors. There weren't that many changes being made, I think. And, uh, and it was two years gone. So with the time that uh, COVID was supposedly something of the past, Time had moved. You forget, don't you? They impacted on yeah. so many different lives in so many different Absolutely. ways. Absolutely. Um, so we're almost out of time. I, I, I've read about Rapid Bucharest. I don't, it, well, it, do you know where that's come from? I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, where it came <laughs> from. I think that there was a couple of journalists from, from Romania had been in touch with me right. to say what... And um, I don't have an agent working for me, never had. But would you would and you have one last hurrah? I, I, I think that... Would, I, I suppose, like everything... I have to, well, first of all, I'm, I, I genuinely don't think I'm a Luddite. I do think that I actually have an open mind to things. There's certain things I'm definitely close to. There's no question about it. Nobody will change my mind about certain things. But in footballing terms, I'm aware of the changes that are there. I know I've got two daughters as well who tell me, Dad, you know, sometimes you have to get into the real world. And I do <laughs> feel that. Yes. There's no question about it. So I'm open to changes and things that you see. But I believe that the game has moved to you're no longer... I used to manage football clubs. I managed. I was given carte blanche to manage them for, and I did manage them in the manner in which Sir Alex Ferguson would manage Manchester United. So I knew every part of it. Whereas now you are, you're, you, with the exceptions of the likes of Klopp sure. and Guardiola, who have proved themselves. But most of the managers are, I can't, dare I say it, heads of department now. 
you know, this is your job. Your your job is to look after players. We'll bring you the players, you know. So a CEO that didn't exist in my time or or a, 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 or a director of football didn't exist in my time. And I, I, again, I'm not against it I as long as I have a as long as I have a say in bringing that director of football. I don't want one thrust upon me who's a totally different idea to the game than I have. So never say never, or oh no, no I'm getting older. Okay. I'm getting older, and I I would have to say, I mean, there's a twenty year difference, and you will you'll enjoy the twenty years between I, I, now I, 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 and it, it starts uh, now. I, <laughs> what what um. Is there anything you didn't achieve that you would have liked to? I'd love to have won the FA Cup. Uh, well, that Absolutely. was about. It was, so it was I'd that Wolves have, game, wasn't it? When, lo- the, 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 when I when I was growing up, when I was growing up, you uh, and Brian. The, the, Both of you would have loved to have won uh, yeah, an absolutely, FA Cup. Absolutely, to the FA Cup because the FA Cup was the competition. It was the only yeah. live game on TV and I grew up with the FA Cup. And uh, yeah, so uh, and the year that Nottingham Forest won a double, we got beaten by West Bromwich Albion in the set, in the quarterfinal and had we been able to have managed to get through that, I think we'd have gone on to have won the treble that year in 1978 and that would have been great. And so the FA Cup, yes, and I do, I've got envy of those people who've gone up and say, well, well, we've won it three times. So I just to have won it once would have been great. And finally, if you had to pick one of these, one of these myriad achievements, I think I know what you're going to say. But I think, Yeah, I think that the, the naturally, as a, at, cl- at club level, to winning the European Cup. And I have to say that night in Valencia, when we beat Spain to be in the quarterfinals, Northern Ireland to be in the quarterfinals of the World Cup, that takes on beating as well. Martin O'Neill, thank you. No, thank you, James. Thank you very much for inviting me. 